Dear church and friends, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a special feeling that is built up within us, isn't there? It is an anticipation that seems to start earlier and earlier every year. As fall comes to an end, as we close out our Thanksgiving celebrations, as we make our way into winter, the days get colder and colder. The days get shorter and shorter. The days get darker and darker. But the thoughts of Christmas and the one true light coming into the world become more and more profound. As we near the day of Christmas, there is an eagerness that is built up. We are nearing the day when we will celebrate with our church gathering and within our families the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ into the world. There is an anticipation that grows as we approach celebrating the birth of our Savior. I want to speak this morning about anticipation, but not in a post-Christ coming type of way. Not in the year A.D. type of way, but in the year B.C. type of way. Prior to the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, before the wise men make their way into Jerusalem, before the angels proclaim to the shepherds, before the manger, before the travel to Bethlehem, before the angel coming to Mary and Joseph, before all that we see in the New Testament accounts regarding Christmas, there's a great biblical Christmas anticipation that is built up that overwhelmingly grows, that escalates, that intensifies, that grows, that becomes more and more clear on the pages of Old Testament Scripture. Like an avalanche coming down a steep snowy mountain. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We see more And understand more and more as we make our way through the Old Testament scriptures. If we start reading about Christmas in the Gospels of the New Testament, we will miss that anticipation completely. We will read about the event, we will get to the event without knowing what led up to the event. We will miss what the saints of the Old Testament called the coming. So where does it begin? Where does it start? Every feeling of anticipation has a starting point. Where does the anticipation in the Old Testament begin? When do we first hear the news of the coming Lord Jesus Christ? How far back? Do we need to go in scripture to see the first mention of Christ coming into the world as a Savior and Lord? When was the gospel, the good news of Christ coming, first proclaimed? Let's turn our attention to the book of Genesis. The book called, titled, Beginnings. Because in it we see the very beginning of life. In it we see the very beginning of humanity and creation. It is in the very beginning of the Bible, on the very first few pages of the Bible, that we hear, that we see the first gospel message of the coming Lord and Savior. We are going to read from the very familiar third chapter of the book of Genesis, a chapter which we most commonly ascribe to the fall of men. For in it we see the serpent in action. We see the serpent as he makes his way into the mind of Eve and deceives her by convincing her to sin against the Lord God. And eat of the forbidden fruit. We see Adam and Eve who disobey the Lord. 
We see humanity at its worst. We see humanity in darkness. We see humanity in its sinful nature. Complete defeat. And God's holy judgment are the overarching themes of this chapter. As the creation account unfolds in the very first two chapters of the book of Genesis, we see God's goodness in prosperity. He creates everything wonderful. He creates everything harmonious. He creates everything beautiful and good, and then it is as if the celebration music ends. As Adam and Eve fall into sin, fall into disobedience. Adam and Eve's commitment to the Lord ends fast, very fast. But God's goodness, God's graciousness doesn't end in chapter 3. It is here that it actually intensifies. It is here that it becomes more and more evident. It is in this very chapter that we see the very gracious and just nature of our God. In the very chapter about the fall of men, we see the first mention of the gospel. That alone speaks volumes of our Lord. The good news comes out of a very dark place. The news of victory is proclaimed on defeated ground. Like a beam of bright light that penetrates through the darkest clouds, the gospel shines in the middle of God's righteous judgment for the sin of men. Likewise shines the steadfast goodness of God. It is in this very chapter that we truly get a sense that God is still good. For he is the one that proclaims the gospel to Adam and Eve. He is the one that sets off the anticipation of the coming Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read together. The book of Genesis chapter 3 verses 8 through 19. This is right after the act of disobedience by Adam and Eve. This is right after the forbidden fruit was eaten. Genesis 3.8. This is God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me with me. She gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat, all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, 
and to dust you shall return. God graciously comes in the cool of the day. It is unclear as to what time of the day it was when God came. It could have been evening. When the sun goes down and the air becomes cooler and more crisp by evening. Maybe that is what is meant by the statement in the cool of the day. Maybe it was early the next morning with the morning breeze. As a theologian and preacher from the 16th century says, being covered with their garment, they passed the night in silence and quiet. The darkness aided their hypocrisy. Then about sunrise being again thoroughly awakened, they recollected themselves. We know that at the rising of the sun, the air is naturally excited. Together then with the gentle breeze, God appeared. Maybe he came in the morning on the next day. Either way, either evening or early morning, the, time, the next day, the text is implying that some time has passed before God appeared in the cool of the day. God didn't come out of nowhere in wrath and smite Adam and Eve for their sin hot-handed. He didn't come as soon as they transgressed his commandment. He was obviously very aware of what Adam and Eve have done. For he is all-knowing and all-present. But God chose to come in a different way. Not in fiery wrath but in the cool of the day, which shows his gracious nature. God came with a distant sound, as if walking, as if steps slowly approaching, as if getting closer and closer, as if he's aware of their fear and devastation. Adam and Eve had the time to scramble, to run away in fear from the sound of God into the forest and scramble among the trees. God is gentle with Adam and Eve as he approaches them. God knew when to come. He appeared when the emptiness of sin has sunk in. Some time has passed. Sin has accomplished its task. Sin has done what it does best it leaves a person empty. Isn't that exactly it about sin? It only takes a little bit to feel the emptiness of sin sink in. Of what was supposed to bring great satisfaction. That is the nature of sin. As enticing as it is, as cunning as it is, as deceitful as it is, it leaves the person empty devastated, and with no answers. That which was supposed to bring fulfillment brought only ruin, despair, regret. Adam and Eve never experienced this in their life. Imagine what it was like to experience this for the first time. In fear, shaken, Devastated, running away from God and in handmade lousy garments made out of leaves which they tried to put together themselves as an attempt to fix the situation themselves. To simply cover that which was broken. To amend their mistake, which is a symbol, of course. We cannot deal with our own sinfulness. Every attempt to deal with our own sinfulness by ourselves is a lousy attempt to simply cover what is broken. Imagine their devastated state. But God is gracious. God doesn't leave them in the state. God doesn't leave them shaken and naked dealing with their own sin. 
He comes. He comes seeking. He comes looking. As a good shepherd, he comes looking for his lost sheep. As a good father, he comes looking for his lost son and daughter who are devastated by their sin. God graciously draws Adam and Eve back to himself with his word. God graciously draws Adam and Eve back with his word. Then the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? As if God doesn't know exactly where Adam is. As if the trees are big enough to cover Adam. To hide from the Lord. Something that you do not see very often in scripture is a sovereign God asking questions. Non-rhetorical questions at that. As if he truly doesn't know. And he is asking to Adam, he says, where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you, not, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? To Eve, what is this you have done? God who created the heavens and earth, king of all creation, Lord over history and time, who has all knowledge, who has all wisdom, and has all the answers, who is omnipresent and sees everything, who in numerous times in these verses is called the Lord God, who is sovereign, is asking questions of his creation. Obviously, his questions have a different intent. Obviously, he is asking not to know something as if he doesn't know. The intent of the questioning is to draw Adam and Eve back to himself, to lead them in, to allure them back, to bring them out of hiding, to come clean before the Lord, to repent of their actions, to restore what is broken. What Adam and Eve heard was the all-familiar voice of God. God speaking. God's word is proclaimed. God's word penetrates through their darkness. As God speaks, Adam makes his way out of hiding. He draws near to the Lord. He approaches the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Who can restore the devastation of sin? Is it not God himself? Is it not only God? What can draw people to God? Is it not his holy word? Is it not him speaking? God graciously asks questions to lead Adam and Eve to repentance. Notice there is no questioning of the serpent. God doesn't ask any questions of the serpent. What a serpent gets is a divine curse for his actions without an opportunity to defend himself. Without an opportunity to answer any questions. We know he's capable of speaking as he did with Eve. Yet we do not see him speaking in the presence of the Lord. He is quiet. For he is already doomed for destruction. He is already the one who rebelled against the Lord. For he is already a fallen being. For his destiny is already sure. The investigation, the questioning comes to an end. As someone rightly put it, the trial has now reached the fountainhead of sin. God got to the root of the issue. The serpent who is judged. What is absolutely astonishing is that the gospel message, the good news message, is proclaimed in the middle of a curse. The gospel message is placed in the sentencing of the serpent out of a dark place. The gospel shines. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. 
he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The curse or the judgment entailed three things. Humility of the serpent, enmity with the woman, and final total defeat from the one who is called the woman's seed. We know that the devil chose the snake as an agent of his plan. We know that there's more to the animal than meets the eye. We know that the devil took advantage of a created animal and spoke to Eve through it. The words of deceit came not from the snake itself. The source was someone else. Therefore, the word serpent in this account is speaking of two beings in one. The animal that God created which became the instrument of deceit and the fallen angel himself who is in the book of Revelations called the great dragon, the serpent of old. Revelations 12.9 The judgment therefore is on the snake and Satan. There's a lot of double meaning in how God proclaims his judgment. It is as if the judgment starts with the animal but makes its way onto the real perpetrator. The real source of the issue. God says, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. The snake is separated from all the created, domesticated, and wild animals as being cursed by God. This does not mean that the other animals were cursed. As you, as you can see, it says more than. The text in the original language is implying only the snake is cursed. The snake as the animal becomes a symbol of God's righteous judgment. The snakes, the serpents that we see today in our life are reminders of the judgment that happened in Eden. Sort of like the rainbow is a symbol of God's mercy. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. This might imply that the serpent had a different mode of mobility before the curse. Maybe he walked. Maybe he ran. Maybe he jumped. Maybe he looked completely different. Maybe he was different in appearance. Maybe he was more attractive to the eye. Maybe that is why Eve speaks with him so openly. But he now finds himself crawling on the floor and eating dust. Snakes literally eat dust as they devour their food. But the phrase also means a humble state, a state of humility. God puts the devil in a humble state. We see this phrase used in other passages of the Bible. For example, in the book of the prophet Micah, speaking of the nations that opposed God. Here's what it says, Micah 7, 16 and 17. Nations will see and be ashamed of all their might. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses to the Lord God. They will come in dread and they will be afraid before you. The statement, dust you will eat, is symbolizing a new lowly state. A humble state. God puts the devil in a lowly state. In this we see the true relationship of God to Satan. As Lord over his creation. As a created being, he must submit to the Lord. They are nowhere near being equal in power. There is no comparison between the two. There is no battle happening between the two. Satan is a created being in total submission under the hand of Almighty God. The one who has created glorious and splendor. The one who has created beautiful as an angel of the Lord. Now occupies a lowly state. As he slithers his way among everything defiled, rotten, and dead. But yet again, we see the gracious nature of our God. God graciously converts Eve's affections from the serpent. 
God graciously converts Eve's affections from the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. The word enmity here means hatred, opposition, animosity. They will no longer be friends. That which stole Eve's affection from the Lord, that which drew her in to listen closely rather than listen to God, that which found a close and dear place in Eve's heart and mind, now will be in total opposition. Eve's affections have been graciously changed toward the serpent. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, a finite action by a sovereign Lord. God says, I will. We see this play out on the pages of Scripture. We see this play out on the pages of history. Eve here represents all of humanity, for she is called the mother of all living. There is now an enmity that exists between two people groups that will come from Eve, two seeds. Humanity is now divided into two people that are called the people of God and the people of the devil. Elsewhere in the Bible, they are called the children of God and the children of the devil. People that are born of God and worship him, that are adopted into his family and another group. People that are in their sinful nature, following after the devil. That are by nature like their father, the devil. That are under his dominion and power, unregenerated and unsaved, headed for destruction. It doesn't take long in scripture to see this opposition play out in the very next chapter in two brothers born of the same woman, Cain and Abel. 1 John 3, 11 and 12, Apostle John says this about Cain. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. We see a very real opposition develop on the pages of Scripture in two brothers. Symbolizing two people groups in opposition to one another. The righteous and the wicked. The lost and the found. The saved and the doomed. Here we must keep in mind though. It is only by God's grace and mercy that we were adopted into his family as his children. We are called the children of the Most High God. Apostle John says right before that in 1 John 3, 1, he says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. See how great a love the Father bestowed on us. It is only by the sheer love of God that we may be called children of God and not children of the devil. We are changed by his mercy. We are made new by his grace. After walking as children of the devil in darkness, following paths of unrighteousness, we have seen the light. We have heard his voice. We have been saved. And finally, we get to the Christmas message. God graciously proclaims the gospel of hope and victory in Christ Jesus. God graciously proclaims the gospel of hope and victory in Christ Jesus. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel, theologians for a very long time have called this passage the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. It is the first mention of the coming Messiah who will be victorious, who will save his people for the dominion, from the dominion of death and darkness. He will be a light that comes in a dark place. This is a profound thought. 
A victory is promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden. The anticipation builds as we make our way through the Bible. The anticipation starts with Adam and Eve, who heard the gospel message and believed. At the very beginning of creation, before judgment is even announced to Adam and Eve, before God lays out the consequences of their sin, God graciously provides a message of hope and salvation. At this point, not everything, of course, is known about the Messiah. The anticipation builds as we make our way through the Bible because more and more things are known about the coming Messiah. Having the whole Bible today, we now know exactly who God is talking about here. But all Adam and Eve had was a promise of the coming Messiah, of the coming Savior. It was enough for them to believe and be saved. It was enough for their son Abel to believe and be saved. And it was enough for people after them to believe and be saved. Salvation always happened by grace through faith in the coming Savior and Lord. People in the Old Testament were saved just like you and I. By grace through faith. Although not everything is known about the coming Jesus Christ in this verse, few things about the Savior are sure and they are promised. First of all, he will be born of a woman. He will be born human. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. The word seed is a word that means offspring. The word seed here means children. It is talking about being born, being born specifically of a woman. The word seed has two meanings. It could be plural, talking about multiple seeds, talking about humanity as a whole, but it could also be understood as singular, the seed. The offspring. The child. That is why the translators of the Bible included the word he in the text. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. It will be a human, born of a woman. Secondly, he will defeat the enemy. He shall bruise you on the head. A blow to the head of a snake is deadly and final. That is where all of its venom lies. That is where the life of the snake lies. The coming Savior will completely destroy the enemy. The coming Savior will completely annihilate the enemy. Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2 says what Jesus Christ coming into the world has already accomplished on the cross. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. In verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Paul is speaking of the devil and his demons. He already produced a blow to the enemy. The enemy is already disarmed. The enemy is already a defeated foe. But he is waiting. Another coming. He is waiting another coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in which the final blow will be made to the head of the serpent and final, complete victory will be established. Thirdly, the Savior will be bruised in the process. The Savior will be bruised in the process. The saving work will come at a cost. There is a bruising that will happen. 
He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The Savior will be bruised in the saving process. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The fulfillment of this promise, of course, is found in the gruesome crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was bruised on the heel. He paid the cost on our behalf. Lastly, he will be restored from the bruising. The bruising on the heel is not like the bruising on the head. They are not equal The bruising on the heel will be healed. It is not a deadly blow. It is not a final blow. The Savior will recover. The Savior will live. He is risen. He is risen indeed. 1 Corinthians 15.3, Apostle Paul says, "For, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Scriptures like Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. What a glorious gospel. What a glorious savior. What a glorious salvation. What a gracious Lord God. God is gracious as he creates everything wonderful, harmonious, and good in Eden. We see his goodness in creation all around us. We enjoy his creation and goodness. But God is much more gracious when he restores a fallen man and a fallen woman. As he redeems them from, for his own glory. As he gives them life. As he adopts them as children by and through the message of the gospel. The message of his salvation. Every time a soul is saved by the blood of Christ, he gets glory. His graciousness is put on display. The anticipation that starts in the Garden of Eden reaches its climax and fulfillment in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. We can now better feel the anticipation of Apostle Andrew when he ran to his brother Peter and said, we have found the Messiah. We can now better feel the anticipation of the Samaritan woman who was speaking with Jesus Christ and said, I know that Messiah is coming. To whom Jesus responded, I who speak to you am he. The Messiah has come. That is what we are celebrating these next couple of weeks. God coming in human form to rescue us from the dominion of darkness and death. God graciously draws Adam and Eve back to himself and tells them the gospel. Which becomes their hope and salvation. For many others in the Old and New Testament as well. Likewise for us. I will end with a hymn that was written by Henry Gilmore in 1890 called Love Found Me. When out in sin and darkness lost, my fainting soul was tempest tossed. I heard the Savior's words so blessed. Come, weary, heavy laden, rest. The Spirit roused me from my sleep. Conviction seized me strong and deep. Although I long withstood His grace, He wooed me to His kind embrace. I'll praise Him while He gives me breath. 
for saving from an endless death. Christ is my advocate above. I'm yoked to him in perfect love. And when I reach the gold-paved streets, I'll sit adoring at his feet and sing hosannas round the throne where I shall know as I am known. To God be the glory. Let's pray together. Amen.